The Global Conservation Corps presents the Rhino Man podcast. I'm John Jerko, your host and one of the directors of Rhino Man the Movie. This podcast series is a way for me to interview top conservationists on the topics of rhinos, the poaching crisis, the importance of rangers, and community engagement. All as a way to create awareness around these issues and to promote the coming release of our documentary film. In this episode, I'm talking with Grant Folds. Grant is a conservationist, consultant, educator, and author of two books. He grew up in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, where his family and neighbors came together to form the now famous Amakala Game Reserve. He's the director of the KZN Project Rhino Alliance NPC and the ambassador and manager for Rhino Art. He splits his time between range expansion projects, marketing, fundraising, youth education, and speaking about the work being done in the field. His two books, Saving the Last Rhinos and Rewilding Africa, can be found on Amazon. In this conversation, we talk about Grant's early days of growing up on the family farm, his entrepreneurial beginnings in goat farming, and the development of the Amakala Game Reserve. We talk about his involvement in rhino art with adventurer Kingsley Holgate, the work at Project Rhino and their efforts in range expansion, ranger support, youth education, and building a conservation economy. We go into the many stories related in his books and dive into some of his rewilding projects with a focus on the development of the Loziba Wildlife Reserve. Grant's books and life story are a masterclass in conservation. This episode is full of stories of passionate people coming together to make a difference. So without further ado, let's jump into the conversation. All right, welcome to the show, Grant. It's an absolute honor to have you on here. Uh, you're a legend of conservation, and I can't wait to dive into your story. Yeah, thank you, John. Honored to be here. And yeah, anytime we can add value to conservation and the movie and all the podcasts, you're welcome. Yeah, for sure. And I think my buddy Matt is the one that told me to get a hold of you. And before I got connected to the project, we did an interview with your brother, Dr. William Folds, for the film. And he's he's in the film and a little bit in the new trailer we just put together. So yeah, I feel like this has been a long time coming. So excited to dive in. Yeah, William is the, although he's younger than me, I would say he's He's the more well-known and renowned, world-renowned or whatever. I'm, I'm just serving my apprenticeship. Well, let's start off with maybe giving an overview of what you do. Like, what, what would you tell someone if you were at a party and they asked you, what do you do? Because I feel like I could think of 20 or 30 things you could say, but what do you say nowadays? Uh, I suppose a, a, a master of none, you know. <laughs> I wear many hats and a master of none. Um, I would say, essentially, I'm a, I'm a conservationist philanthropist, conservationist, social ecologist, or whatever you'd like to call it, predominantly in rhino conservation. I'm a director of Project Rhino, and that happened over a decade or so. You don't just become a CEO, director, whatever you'd like to call it. I'm not a title person. I, I've been nominated for some awards, but I like to say that I have no awards, which is one of my, my <laughs> things. And when I do get an award up, I'm going to have my 100% non-award blemished. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we do these things because we care and maybe we could do them better, but we can only do them with as much ammunition or information or funding that we have to be conservation-minded. Absolutely. Why don't we start off with giving a little bit of an overview of some of your bigger projects that you've been a part of over the year. Project Rhino, maybe give some background to that and the Rhino Art Project. Yeah, so Project Rhino, as I said, I'm a director of Project Rhino, which is an organization, a nonprofit organization, an NPC in South Africa, which controls about 400,000 hectares of rhino range expansion, which does a, a lot of collaborating with several reserves on everything from surveillance of aircraft and anti poaching units, training of rangers, education. Re rewilding, which is we call range expansion, collaboration, judiciary. So we would see court dockets through to the final thing. Sometimes what's contentious is that we do go for paying for information to lead to arrests and so on. So that is basically Project Rhino in a nutshell. And out of Project Rhino is a, a community conservation education wing, which is called Rhino Art. It was started by a very a colorful fellow called Kingsley Holgate, the most traveled man in Africa, enormous chap with a beard down to his <laughs> belly. And he is an absolute pleasure to be working with because Africa 
is never dull with him around. You know, he knows everyone, he knows every everywhere, and he's also passionate about educating the youth in environmental awareness from rhinos to elephants to any small creature. Can you talk a little bit about what rhino art is and, and how you participate in it? Yeah, rhino art basically was started by Kingsley in, in Mozambique about a decade ago, where he saw the need in, in the war zone in Masanjir to educate these people. And he had an idea to take an A4 piece of paper and tell the children in the class to draw what they thought would be a solution to the rhino problem. And it wasn't an exam or an assignment that they could fail, which is my type of exam and mine and yours if you don't want to learn. (laughs) So you draw on there what you think is happening and what you think the solution could be. They give you an outline of a rhino. At that stage, I don't think there was even an outline. We later developed this outline and then we developed text with information on it for them to be able to get a lesson from the educator. So the educator normally spends 45 minutes on rhino conservation, where, why, what is happening, you know, does it have a role, have you seen a rhino, and all those questions basically are on that page. And they then draw it, you come back a month later or two weeks later when the teacher is ready, and you question them, you judge the art, you have winners, the winners get a certificate, they play soccer if they can, there's big pomp and ceremony, And they never forget what they learned because it's a visual experience. So that's how Rhino Art started. And we go from school to school. We've got a vehicle with a mobile sound system on it. And it stops in the quad. We have an appointment, three or four a day. And the educator, which is normally Richard Mabanga and his associates, which he's taught over the years. Occasionally, I would go along if you or Matt, and Matt's been on one actually, so he Mm. knows what we're talking about. We would have some guests on there and they get introduced colorfully and what role they're playing in conservation. He then some, says something uh, you know, in his own language, if it's English, if it's Vietnamese or whatever, they learn and j- joke about it and, and so on. And then the serious part is how much did you learn? So that is effectively a very cheap, we call it a passport to reach a child mm. for about one rand, which is literally... 10 U.S. cents per child, less than 10 U.S. cents per child, to educate them and create an awareness on rhino conservation and the problems we are facing. Yeah, and I feel like community engagement is such a huge part of what we need to do in conservation. It's a big part of what GCC is doing, especially with youth and education. And uh, yeah, you have some great stories about rhino art in in both of your books. And that's kind of what I want to go into next. And I feel like you know, most of this conversation will come from a lot of the stories in your two books over the last several years. The first one, Saving the Last Rhinos, and the most recent one, Rewilding Africa. Could you talk about why you decided to write these books? Yeah, Johnny, if I can maybe mention the first book, which is Saving the Last Rhinos. And um, I was working as a wildlife mercenary, kind of, if you can call it that, in, in a wildlife way in the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, inspired by the fact that the last two northern white rhinos um, remained in the world. And they happened to be in Garamba at the time, or they were sent to a zoo, and then they they were re, uh, relocated from, from a Czech zoo back to Old Pejita in Kenya. So I just thought, you know, if I'm, th- and this was a long time ago now, and if I'm going to make a difference to Africa, I must do it with the most iconic of these species, which is rhinos. And uh, I wasn't there for rhinos. I was there to establish a park in the DRC. When I got there, I didn't like what I saw. I tried to do my best at the time, and I think that's also in the book. Mm. It was a little bit of a mess because the Congolese have kind of lost their way since the Belgians, you know, since they took over from the Belgian Congo. Uh, It was a great conservation success story at the time. and then post-colonialism and so on. And and I'm not saying colonialism is the right way, but that's what happened. It fell into the Civil War with Maputo and all that. And I incidentally ran his park. He was long gone, but I happened to be at Park de Lanzela, which is the park of Maputo, the former dictator Maputo Sesuseko. Mm. But, you know, reading the book by Lawrence Anthony, Graham Spence, I was then 
well, not provoked, but just thought, wow, I, I'm so inspired. And I kind of, on my phone, made some notes. And when I got back, I was able to get through Lawrence Anthony's widow, Francoise, the name of Graham Spence. And Graham hates a beer, so do I. And we met with Bush Tavern and we sank a court. We decided <laughs> after the third pint of beer that I couldn't afford to write the book. A year later, we met, and again, we sang three more pints, and I decided that I still hadn't, my financial position hadn't changed until eventually we got a contract to write the book. So that started the book, and everything just developed. You know, I'd come back from Vietnam. I'd bought some rhino, illegally rhino horn illegally, so that I could see where the market, you know, having tried to do what we did in South Africa, I was very curious as to how, things got there and how they were sold and how they were trafficked. And is it really rhino horn? At that time, there were talk of buffalo horns being leaked into the market as rhino horn. And yeah, I managed to buy the stuff and bring it back. So all of these stories just came out, you know, chapter after chapter. And I don't write the books. Eh? So they said if Grant, you know, stops conservation and, and tries to write, then <laughs> that'll be the end of him, you know. What's what's the process like? I'm just curious, working with Graham. Yeah, Graham, he's a miracle writer. I mean, yeah, I'm sure you agree now, having mm-hmm. tortured yourself to read two books as a <laughs> as an English set work for an interview. But he, you know, he's so easy and he spent time with me. And obviously we've had, you know, the three or four dozen court beers together. So he understands the humor because everything has to be humorous, you know. Life is so serious that he likes to throw in some humorous actions. And there are many of them in the book. There are many of them in my life, although there's a lot of sadness as well. Mm. But, you know, he knows exactly what I'm trying to create in the story. I dictate it to him in a podcast or in a WhatsApp, you know, and then he writes it out. He has an hour interview per chapter. He sends me the draft, and then he goes through all the facts. And then we bash that thing around probably do a chapter every fortnight. Mm. Yeah, you can't believe how I look forward to listening to the next story, Yeah, which is almost like the podcast. You know? <laughs> it's very, very interesting to see what you've done in his words because he writes it in my word, in, in my language, which, you know, I, I kind of have to relive this. And, and I often think, well, is it really me, you know, doing all this stuff? You know? mm-hmm. And it probably... Many, many people could write books, but they don't have the combination. And I was just fortunate to find the right man to do the job. And then, of course, the marketing people get hold of it, and then it's saving the lost rhinos. I wanted some other arbitrary name, mm-hmm. you know. So those are beyond me. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because, like you said, you were inspired by Lawrence Anthony's book. I think it was called The Last Rhinos, right? The one he wrote about Garamba. It's, I actually yeah. read that one. And... Yeah, I mean, when you were there, in your book, it sounded like you still had a little bit of hope that there might be some northern white rhinos that were hidden out there still, and maybe you can bring them back. Yeah, I, I promise you, as I'm sitting here today with a hole in my backside, um, I don't know how many people I've, I've spoken to that almost like the Loch Ness Monster, mm. they still believe that somewhere in southern Sudan there are northern white rhinos. And I've heard it from 10 people, and not many people go to southern Sudan because I think it's the most dangerous country in Africa right now. You know, they've got everything from ISIS to LRA to all those sort of things. But I I spoke to another doctor, Dr. Joseph Okori, who's done some work in the area in southern Sudan. He firmly believes it. I know Johan Maria went on an expedition recently to find traces of it. There have been some community peoples, and now we're talking about the Loch Ness Monster. (laughs) <laughs> saying that they've seen some animals that are hippopotamus and hippopotamus don't live miles and miles away from water. Mm-hmm. So these are uneducated people that hardly have a you know, piece of clothing on them. So I'm still hopeful. There's a new sequel, which we won't go into now, about a, a project I'm doing in northern Uganda, which will probably come into book three. Mm-hmm. And it's on the border of Uganda, Kenya, and, and southern Sudan. So who knows? Yeah, really interesting stuff. And I've been following too. You know, I had James Mwenda, who was one of the caretakers at El Pejita. Yeah. And talked about Sudan and his experience there. And 
you know, they're trying to do the intravenous and try to bring them back with southern white rhinos. So that's, yeah, who knows what's going to happen there, but lots of interesting efforts. I mean, it's it's sad that we had to get to this point that we have to do all of these things to try and, and keep them going, but at least there's still some hope. Yeah, I feel like let's, let's go into Rewilding Africa, because that's your newest book. And I think we'll be jumping back and forth as we, we go through some of these stories. But yeah. what inspired you to write another book? And also the title Rewilding Africa, maybe that was just the marketing, but I feel like I heard in another podcast, there was a time where you're going to call it Cruel Planet or something of the, to that effect. So how did that all come about? I wrote the book as Cruel Planet, mm. completely written a, as Cruel Planet. Basically, I had no idea it was going to be called Re- Rewilding Africa until the final chapters and they handed them out, you know. Mm-hmm. And and I suppose in hindsight, it hasn't been a bad, you know, idea to to rename it that because it had a lot of rewilding and, and I was completely, Graham kept on saying to me, you can't write about another failure. You can't write <laughs> another failure. You can't repeat another rewilding. I mean, I'm doing a, an amazing project for Greater Kuduland, merging it with Nanedi up in the north in the Baobab country now. And I was desperate to write about it because it had rock art, it had sand, it had Makungubwe, mm-hmm. the golden rhino. And he said, no, I can't write about it because you're over rewilding. You're talking about the Loziba and then you're jumping to Magic Hills and then you're going to the mm-hmm. Kalahari and then you're talking about Angola and then you're going to Mozambique. So let's cut out three or four of your future projects, you know. And the Cruel Planet was as a direct result, A, because I lost Bayes Kutsia. In, in this elephant thing at Loziba. And then a year later, my colleague and Peter Rutsch, who was the lawyer, who's 78 years old, he was a great man of conservation, gave up his life for conservation. He died of COVID. And then in between that, one of the most incredible Americans I'll ever meet, a chap called Chris Holcroft, who gave me 100,000, well, not only me, but projects in Africa, $100,000, Mm. sold his business in the USA and he wanted to give back Africa, touched his heart. He came back time and time again. And he dropped down dead and I was director of his nonprofit called Wild 911. As a result of that, unfortunately, we never followed on with the with the Wild 911 because there were some disputes over his post-mortem and then there was a dispute with his intellectual property, which was his mm. photographs and so on. So we parked that off so much conflict and so much time and you can only take so much it distracts you from your end goal mm-hmm. hence my story the crew planet of course it was during COVID. it started during COVID, and the cruelty of the world locking down was probably the most apt name of them all you know through arguably a bat that infected and slowed the whole world down yeah i mean it's it's definitely there's so many challenges that pop up in that book and we'll definitely dive into a lot of them because just the process of overcoming them, I'm definitely interested in talking to you about and and how you managed to do that. But before we really jump into all of that, I'd like to kind of go back to your early days. You know, where did you grow up? How did you get connected to wildlife and conservation? What were some of the, some of your earliest memories? Yeah, earliest memories was camping out in the bush with my closer friends. I really didn't have any white friends. There's a story, a, a humorous story that Richard goes, I don't know if you read Richard, my rhino art person, who tells all the people that I'm not really white, I'm actually black. Mm-hmm. And my mother put me in the fridge and she forgot me in the fridge. And when she came to open the door, I was still alive because the door was ajar. But I popped this white kid with funny hair, you know. And that's how I became. And when he tells everybody that, they're absolutely aghast and it it becomes the (laughs) humorous part of the day. So effectively, I killed birds and ate berries and lived in the bush. And, you know, our parents would often say, not so much with my brother because he's 10 years younger than me, "Uh, where's Grant? I haven't seen him for three days, you know. (laughs) And when you're with our African staff or close-up people, you're probably safer than you are in any Western world, you know. And that's where we were living, in, in the bush, you know, just under the stars and kind of learning all about roots and tubers and cutting sticks and living off the land and with a tin of condensed milk. I, I remember that was mm. the most favorite takeaway from mom's pantry, a tin of condensed milk, because you could live a whole day on that by 
breaking, putting a hole in with a screwdriver on the one side and sucking on the other side, you know, and, and that would feed you for a day. Yeah, and then obviously, you know, you go into that hunting phase, most boys do, and I don't hate people for it because it's just part of growing up on in a wild place, you know. You, you get a pellet gun and then you get your drivers not licensed because you can hardly see over the steering wheel. But you start using the oldest vehicle on the farm, you know, and driving around. And then you that was from the horse, from the pony to the horse, and then a little motorbike and then a little vehicle, you know, and this is when you're 14 years old. You know, the, the girls haven't kicked in and, you know, you still hate school, but you have to go to school and mm-hmm. didn't brush your teeth properly, you know, <laughs> and all those things. Didn't comb your hair. Mother used to say there are potatoes growing in your ears. Yeah, I've heard that one. <laughs> we're black. I'm sure you've heard that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those were the early days, you know, and William had a very similar, William, my brother, had a very similar childhood. But I would say a lot more, you, you know, probably not as primitive, but he also had those privileges, you know. And his changed later on, probably when he was 18. Mine changed when I was 14 or 15. And then I went into the goat business, uh, obviously, which I don't know if you want to elaborate on. Yeah, yeah. I feel like goats were a pretty huge part of your childhood and then also your early adulthood as well. So how did the obsession with goats happen? (laughs) Yeah. So affinity, it all came back to animals, you know, and and I guess I'm trying to save animals now and I'm over 60, you know. But when I, unbeknown to me, when I was six years old, I had this ability to, to work with animals and recognize animals and compassion in one hand, but yet I was killing them to survive on the other, you know. Mouse birds were prey. They were eating mom's guava trees, so we were allowed to shoot them, you know. And then now and again, we'd shoot a bird that was pretty that we weren't allowed to. Then it, it started with goats, and my grandfather bought me six goats, and from that six, I, I'd bred them up to one and a half thousand. <laughs> and I educated myself, and I suppose, again, people you know, oversold the fact that I was the youngest kid at a, at a private school paying for my own school fees out of goats. And they made a big song and dance front page of the paper. What do you think drove you to, I mean, there's definitely the connection to animals, but then there's also the business side. I mean, to grow it that big and I'm guessing you got, you know, support from your family and they supported your project, but <laughs> what drove you to, to kind of create this farming business? So obviously... You know, when, when you're baking your, your cakes out of mom's kitchen, certain ingredients that you probably don't pay for, but you, and it's all profit, but you're not paying for your lights and water and all that sort of thing. So that's where your business sense was meant to kick in. I wouldn't say I'm a, I'm a marvelous businessman because now I look at my colleagues that were at the school that I went to, St. Andrews, a private school, by the way, and they're all CEOs of banks and they drive smart cars and they travel the world first class and I'm in cattle class. You know, I can hardly afford my own vehicle and get badly paid, but that's the life I chose. Yeah, obviously it teaches you a little bit about business. You have your own bank account, you, you sell your goats, you cry, you get attached to them. And when the time comes to sell them, you're so attached, you don't really want to sell them. And you have favorites as well in your goats and you don't sell the one to your favorite. and All that sort of kicks in. But, but it, it was a genuine business. It wasn't fake. My father didn't interfere mm. at all, actually. I was completely bound by my African driver because I didn't have a license. He drove me everywhere. And I had an affinity with another guy called Toli Masumpa who was burnt and he had an ox cart. He used to go around in a cart and he'd put all the goat kids in the back and he had a sheepdog, which was my sheepdog. And it heard the, the sheep. And when I came back, the sheepdog slept under my bed. And when I went to school, sheepdog slept with him and did all the work, you know. So, so those are the, go, the, the growing up thing. And it, it wasn't, it, it really wasn't faked. It was proper. And I started, I, you know, I was so good with animals. I could recognize every, every single animal, one and a half thousand of them, not by name. <laughs> I knew exactly where they were. And so, so did my, my fellow goat man, Toli Masumpa. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we went to shows and we did well and we did badly and we didn't win everything. And it just, you know, it's leveling because you can't always come first in the class, you know. Until sort of adolescence kicked in when I was 15 and 16, all of a sudden, this shy goat farmer who'd never seen a white kid before 
started getting these hormones and, and the girls that were riding the horses in the show became more attractive. <laughs> so we won't go into all those details, but, um, <laughs> but those yeah. are some of the perks of being a goat farmer, not in the hot, you know, in the rugby. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about the importance of goats in the Kosa and, and Zulu culture? And sorry if I'm butchering names here and there. No, very, very important. Obviously, when you're coming of age, you have to slaughter a goat. In the Makweta, when you become circumcised, you use a goat. When there's a death in the family, you use a goat. When there's a 21st in the family, you use a goat. And unfortunately, and this is the cruel side of life that I hadn't, every time a goat gets killed, it bleeds. And, and that's what the Zulu's like. And every time you kill a sheep, it says nothing. So sheep, sheep are killed for meat. But goats are killed for traditional ceremonies, you know, and they use the, the skin of the goat around, around your bracelet to determine some things. A lot of the skins are used when you see the Zulu dancers on their feet and on their muscle arms, upper arms, you know. So, and this has been happening for a lot longer than, you know, Europeans have been in Africa. So those traditions have been passed through the ages. And that's why there's such a demand for goats. Mm. especially the boar goats, you know. The other angora goats, which I didn't really have, are the ones that are shorn for mohair, which is, is what you make your garments out of. But these were just meat goats. And I always say, and this is just a, a trivia, the two most common things in Africa are what, John? Mm. I'm going to fail. <laughs> I'm guessing goats is one of them. <laughs> yeah, one of them is goats and the other one is a generator. A generator, that makes sense. I've gotten used to load shedding from the time I spent there. <laughs> yeah, but not only the load shedding. If you, if you think of it, Africa's power is so sporadic. Mm -hmm. You know, generators are, are, are definitely a main thing in, in Africa, yeah. What about your, so you said you, you did some hunting when you were early on in childhood, but there was a certain story you had in there where you decided you were done with that. Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, no, that, that, well, I'll be very brief because, I mean, I maimed an animal and I was out on my own. I, I had a pen knife. I didn't want to shoot it again. So I tried to kill this thing with a pen knife and it just backfired on me. And the trauma that I went through, I still think of 50 years later. So I just thought, well, this is not for me, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not going to do it. And the part I like about hunting and most people all will say, we don't pull a trigger, but we go along for the ride, you know. And the stories, and the hunters and the campfire and all that. There's some remarkable people that hunt. And they were all the true conservationists in Africa. Frednick, Courtney, Salou, and many, many other people that, that came through Africa. And the, the adventurers that discovered Africa were the great hunters. Mm. So I, I've got nothing against hunting. It's just that personally, I chose another path because of my love for animals i'm i'm not not a vegan and i'm not a vegetarian but i i do host a lot of those people and i aspire probably one day like <laughs> maybe john Keck, where we've we've managed to convince him to go vegan but if i lived in the congo i'd also wouldn't eat meat mm. <laughs> yeah and i think you mentioned in the book too and this is just one of those topics in conservation that hunting and even trophy hunting does actually fund a lot of these projects. And, you know, even though in some cases there's people that do it right and people that do it wrong, but it's, you can't be completely again hunting and, and have the projects that we have right now. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously in the more remote areas of the Eastern Cape, the Karoo, you know, where, where tourism is not on a route, definitely hunting plays its part in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, in Mozambique and the places where only hunters go, you wouldn't find a family going because of malaria and so on. But the hunters are prepared, to, you know, and they like that pristine sort of wilderness type of feel. Mm -hmm. So I don't like to denounce hunting at all because that is part of the thing. Um, just from my point of view, the successes that I've had in ecotourism, where animals are less wild, they don't run, you know, they viewable where you go to hunting reserves, animals do get a fright. So from an ecotourism and a hunting combination, it's very difficult to sell them side by side on, on a, one protected area. Mm -hmm. But by all means, in, in these vast protected areas in Maramu and up in the northern parts of Mozambique and parts of Angola, parts of the large 
sectors of Namibia and in the Eastern Cape, Kalahari, hunting plays an enormous role. So I'm all for that. Yeah. I want to get into Amakala and how that came about. But first, can you define what rewilding is for people? Because I think that's, it seems like Amakala was kind of your first project with you and your family in that kind of area of work. But what is rewilding? And maybe how's that developed over time in your life? If you, if you got to Google out, I would love you to read to the people what, what rewilding <laughs> is. But while you're looking, I can give you my version. What I think rewilding is, is taking a piece of land that was otherwise disturbed, marginal, underutilized, overexploited, and malpracticed, and put into conservationally managed, protected area that has a benefit to people and planet. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I found, uh, re- what is it, rewilding Europe is the first thing that came up, and they say, rewilding is a progressive approach to conservation. It's about letting nature take care of itself, enabling natural processes to shape land and sea, repair damaged ecosystems and restore degraded landscapes. Through rewilding, wildlife's na- natural rhythms create wider, more biodiverse habitats. So it's kind of a poetic way of saying it, I guess, but... <laughs> okay, well, that's the Latin, but I mean, I just gave it in bad South African English. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's exactly what we've done. Can you tell the story of Amakala and how it came about? Why were you guys, you guys were kind of forced to come up with a new plan at a certain point, right? And this is yeah. how this all developed. So I, I had to abandon the farm because I was technically, goats weren't paying the way. You remember I was, I had a young family. I made a very bad decision in dairy farming. So we did the goats and then I went into dairy. I went to America and I studied the dairy system. It's quite ironic to see these movies like Cowspiracy and the way that people battery farm and all that. I mean, I was completely infatuated with milking, you know, 10,000 cows <laughs> in Sacramento or uh, wherever, Wisconsin, you know, Mm -hmm. and just how the Americans did it. And we had all these people to milk, and yet there there were three people milking 10,000 cows, all electronic, of course. Mm -hmm. So my thing went south, and and I still had my goats, but I I left, and I had to come to greener pastures. So I, I went farming with my wife's father for some years. But again, when I discovered where I was living, the guy said, please give me some goats. And that's how the goats came back into my life again. I was able to reestablish myself. But in all this time, my brother became a vet. And he went to London to, to work. He hated every minute of it because he was <laughs> operating on rabbits, cats, dogs, and parrots, you know. And he fell in love again. He'd also done what I did 10 years before. He fell in love with conservation. We went to Kruger National Park. He was a vet, young vet. He ran the symposium for international vets while he was at study. It was quite an honor. He was, I think, the chairman of the group. And that's what got him going. So he and I used to, because he had a student loan, and I used to try and pay his student loans off. And long story short, at that time, we didn't know. So we were trying to get money up the country in little bits. He did the swaps over there, and we were trying to illegally um, <laughs> well, not not cash up, but in small ways, you know. Mm. So I was paying a student loan off and we were dreaming. He was dreaming more about than it with me because I was trying to survive and he was operating and yearning for Africa. And I think his way of dreaming of Africa was to think what we would do to the farm because the farm was not producing what it was. And there were some reasons for that. Sheep theft was a big one because of the population pressures of, Port Elizabeth and so on. Sheep thieving had become a problem, declining margins. We, we'd stopped dairy. The chicory wasn't going so well. And next door, we had a man called Adrian Gardner, a great visionary at Shamwari, the Mantis Collection. We started Shamwari. My dad was involved with that, and he sold him the farm, got involved, you know. And all of a sudden, Shamwari was on the map, and the celebrities poured into Shamwari. There was Tiger Woods getting engaged there. and Richard Branson was coming, you know, and Adrian was a brilliant man in getting media and attention on we thought was a crappy, marginal piece of land. (laughs) What we had south of him was far better, and we thought, why are we such idiots and we're not selling ourselves? So he taught us actually what to not undervalue what we had. 
And through the guest house where my wife and I were living at the time, we started taking the guests from Shamwari and there. And that's what inspired us to go to our neighbors and say, don't you guys want to join? We want to start a reserve. We don't know what to call it, but like Shamwari. And they said, no, no, we're not interested. Mm -hmm. Then eventually over a beer or two, they would say, okay, we'll, we'll give Grant and William one camp and they'd give us a camp. A camp would be 500 hectares or whatever. But they still kept their modern practices, you know, their sheep and their goats and whatever they were doing. Were there fences around your farms at that time? There were fences. So everybody had fences. Small fences, paddocks, camps. You know, the river had irrigation. There was no animals except bushbuck, diker, and one or two kudus. Not many kudus. Mm. The jackals were killed because they were eating the sheep and goats. The leopards, if there was a leopard in the area, it was trapped and killed immediately. <laughs> There were one or two hyenas I saw in my youth, but they were very strange and not welcome at all. And there were a lot of links. But conservation was there in the landscape. But there was no, it was almost very barren. But slowly but surely, we convinced the neighbors. And then we had to work out how we're going to do this because we needed a constitution. So, so basically, we signed up the, the constitution. We were helped by some really amazing people that helped us write this constitution. Uh, one was David Petty. And we got together and, you know, signed this thing at which abided everybody to rules of engagement. Thou shall not do that or thou shall not traverse with that. And if I look back at the history, John, it was embarrassing how primitive we were. But, hey, 20 years later, the lines came back. We bought the first elephants in 2003, 20 mm -hmm. years ago now. The, with the first lions, the first cheetah, the first antelope. We had no money. Nothing much has changed. <laughs> but, you know, we managed to go to people like you and say, John, wouldn't you like to invest in 15 warthogs? The mm -hmm. guy would tap on his calculator and he'd say, 300 rand times nine warthogs, 2,700. But that's only $1,000. Cheapest, I'll give you $1,000. Therefore, the guy bought the warthogs. Now we have warthogs coming out of our ears. We don't know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah. What the lions don't, don't eat, we have to actually, you know, destroy a few because they're just killing everything, you know, the vegetation. Mm -hmm. um, and we capture animals and sell them. Nothing is, is shot because it's an eco-reserve where we're an eco-tourism product. We're not a hunting reserve. Mm -hmm. So our sort of long-term sustainability comes from a bum in a bed or conservation donations, or the sale of game, or the sale of trophy game. But the trophies are taken to other reserves, which obviously they either breed with them or they hunt with them, but not on our reserve at all. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. What, what were some of the first steps once you all agreed to put this together, turn it into a reserve? I mean, did, did you have to put big five fences up? Did you, yeah. what were some of the first animals you brought in? What was that process? So the first, the first animals were actually two giraffe and six zebra. <laughs> and the zebras <laughs> were so wild because they'd been hunted in Tumba Zimbi. And yeah, you'd catch a glimpse of them like once every two months. And I remember following them for days just to see what they looked like. And there were still fences and, and we had no vehicles, no game viewers or anything like that. We just sat with, a, with an old bench, padded bench on the back of a bucky, you know, which is a normal pickup van. Mm-hmm. As a set of binoculars, and when you saw something, you banged on the roof. You know, there was no ranger or anything. My dad was the ranger. You remember, William was still in the UK, and I was in, in Durban, you know, selling goats to try and fund this thing. <laughs> and without that, it wouldn't have happened. I must admit, we've, we've had amazing founder members the Gush family, the Weeks family, the Hart family, and now the Bailey family, and Brenton, Chantel Cook, Paul Nordier, who's, who lives in San Diego all contributed enormously to this thing. And, I, and kind of, I don't do much anymore except do a bit of marketing. My brother does a lot of the veterinary work, but it's, it, it employs over 300 people, you know. It's now on Wild Earth. You can watch it every day on Wild Earth Live. It's a success story, you know. I've been filming there now this last week with my brother with a German television channel. Before COVID, we, we peaked at 30,000 bed nights. And mm. hey, the runner man movies being shot there as well so mm -hmm. and you've seen some of the rhinos and and we've got an incredibly proud you know rhino history even though we have 
lost some. Can you talk about the rhinos and when you first decided to bring them into Amakala and just your connection to them overall? Because I feel like that's definitely one of your passions as well as is, is bringing back those populations. Yeah, unbeknown to me, I, I don't think William or myself were seen any time before 2000 as the rhino people. He was a vet and I had 280,000 rand to buy the first rhino. I can't remember how we funded it and we had no money, but we did. And this rhino was pregnant. Uh, I went to Penda and I caught it with an amazing guy called Dave Cooper, a vet. And William took blood when it arrived. And that was my first, almost first encounter other than what I saw at Shamori with rhinos. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that it would be my career. (laughs) I guess the same goats were the same way. You know, I look back now and I think, well, I'm actually, I've got a goat story. Surely after 40 years of goats, I've got a goat story. Mm -hmm. Now I'm saying, well, after 22 years of rhinos, I've got a rhino story. And people say, yeah, but you're saving the last rhinos. And I always say, no, I'm not, because there's a thousand people that are saving the last rhinos before me. And I mustn't take the credit, just that I wrote the book. So bullshit baffles brains, you know. (laughs) So, yeah, our, our rhino thing started. And then, obviously, we had a calf. And then that calf became the first calf and it was a male calf and where's adult it was sold to to Karecha and that's when William really took off because he wasn't going to be the the world's most famous vet in rhino conservation and and it literally became that way because he operated on the first mutilated rhino that was a survivor can you talk about how that developed as well i mean so when you first moved that rhino onto amakala the poaching crisis wasn't that extreme at that point, right? And no, not until like 2007, eight. Absolutely. So we, and I never forget buying the next two two rhinos at the auction in in, in Pelosi as well with a man called Tony Tabor, who's now since died. I had no money again. Tony was a was a benefactor. He was my dad's best friend at school. Very famous Zimbabwean Rhodesian. Okay, he said, go and buy, and I'll stand you for one rhino, and your limit is. 140,000 rand. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's in the book. But anyway, as it would happen, the, the pair that I had to buy was 307,000. But I got a, <laughs> you know, I got a combination of two. And I phoned him. I said, Tony, the check's going to bounce. And he said, don't worry, sport. I'll support you. You know, <laughs> and then we had three runners. And those three runners became five. And there was no threat of poaching. There was never any, the runner value was high. They were going on for fortunes at the auctions, mm. you know, 600,000, 500,000 rand. I know you've got to convert it to dollars, but, you know, there was money in rhinos. There was money in the in the sale of rhinos, as in Velo, Shui Game Reserve, where rhinos were saved from extinction, balanced their budget with rhino sales. Mm. It was the biggest event of the year. People came from the world over. The zoos came, the buyers came. It was on television. Wow. The tent was big, you know. In fact, they made a story on me and I was a minion buying these two rhinos. You know, I thought, uh, and, and, and I had a limited budget, but i never forget the TV because there were 10 television stations filming the event. Now there's literally no, there's no rhinos. I see in this year's auction, there's 10. Mm. Because I think they just have to sell just to, yeah. to keep you know that's when we, we started and there was absolutely no threat there was no anti-poaching unit yeah i was going to ask what was your security like at that time zero we had a gate guard on the gate going into the reserve which was a thoroughfare and another gate guard on the other side there was zero poaching there may have been a snare or two but there was never talk of any rhino poach not at all even in 2007, 2008, we weren't even concerned because it was something that was happening at Kruger Park. It wasn't even close to Amakala. Yeah. You mentioned in the book that a part of the reason it moved your way was because they started bringing more security to Kruger and pushing back. And so it's, it sounded like that caused people to find the easier targets, which were down south in your area. Yeah. The rhino's name, Giza or Geza? Yeah, Geza. Geza. That was February 11th. Geza and Tosa. Geza. <laughs> Geza. Yeah. So that was February 11th, 2011. And that happened on 
Cariega, is that the name of the reserve? Yeah, Cariega, yeah. Can you tell that story? Because I feel like that's one of the the turning points for William and and kind of fighting back this battle. Never tell another man's story, but it is in the book, so maybe this is my story. Yeah, we'll get him on here eventually. <laughs> yeah, you probably will, yeah, yeah. If you can find him for two hours. <laughs> but he came across this, this rhino, mutilated, very badly mutilated Caucasia. And he said, the world has to see this. You know, I'm not going to put it down because they said, please come and see it. It was so bad. It was limping. You can still see that on a lot of the, the footage now today with the meat hanging off its face. Mm. They really hacked the blood bubbles were, were coming out of its nostrils, you know, because the almost like severing your own nose, your, your breathing passage would be protruded, you know. And he said, let's televise this thing because I'm not going to put it down. The world will never know what these things are going through. We have to make an example of this, this rhino. And he sat there for three hours listening to the thing. You know, they, they almost squeal like whales or dolphins, yeah. you know, with a mew, mew, that sort of sound. He endured the three hours. They filmed the whole thing limping. He had some of the footage on his phone, which I think is, we've all got saved somewhere. And eventually after that, he, he, you know, he put a bullet into it or he, I can't remember if he put the drugs into it. You know, but the footage was there, and then the audacity of the guy who filmed it still tried to steal the bloody footage, which is also another story of it. Yeah, I won't mention his name. And luckily, the owner of Kariha had actually signed a indemnity document to say that mm. that footage was available, and it went on to carte blanche, which I don't know if in Americans know, carte blanche is, is basically a topical Sunday night program that most people watch yeah a lot of like investigative journalism that type of stuff right yeah yeah and, and very topical you know you know it, it it was a it's very emotional to watch that even if you don't cry and our family cries very easy if we if we talk about something we start blabbing so and then he broke down on, on the on the tv again and again you know so yeah and then, and then a few months later the next episode happened which was Tandy and Pemba. Mm. Yeah. At this point, did you start getting rangers? Did you start building an anti-poaching team or was it still a little while before that came about? No, then then obviously the, you know, if I can call it the shit hit the fan and everybody just started had to mobilize with anti-poaching units, albeit very timid compared to what we have today. People having to be aware and vehicles out and patrols out and all that sort of thing, you know. But still, the threat had not hit us properly. It was it was still somewhere beyond mm-hmm. Kruger National Park. Remember, in those days, they were hitting Kenya, Zimbabwe, Tanzania in a massive way. It hadn't even got to South Africa yet mm-hmm. in the late nineties, early two thousands. You know, that's that's when the war zone and the appetite for rhinos was in in Mozambique, having the country going extinct. I think two or three times. <laughs> So all the rhino populations of these wild places that had thousands of rhinos were being wiped out. And that was supplying and fueling the demand for the East, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I've talked to Anton, who's kind of our main ranger in the film. And yeah, when he was being trained, he was saying that, you know, they were telling him that the war is coming to South Africa. And I was always kind of curious, like, why does that make sense? How do they know? But like you said, it's it sounded like the poaching was happening up north just because it was probably easier targets. And then as those rhinos were being poached out, now they were coming to South Africa. So a lot of these rangers were starting to be prepared with more of a paramilitary style of training to be able to fight back. Yeah. You know, for example, the lower Zambezi got wiped out and then Mana Pools in Zimbabwe got wiped out. Not a single rhino left. So you know, we, as we know in Garamba, there were people in my lifetime, I speak to my old mate Paul Dutton, he went there and, and witnessed 687 northern white rhinos. He's now 90, nearly 90. Himself, he said he witnessed. And these people I still talk to, the one was a chap, somebody called, I can't remember their name now, but they've written a book on Garamba. In our lifetime, not long ago, there were these northern whites roaming the world. There. And that's how civil war just, just changed things so quickly. As well as in, in Uganda, where I'm, I'm now currently looking at these projects for runners. Yeah. So how did this pull you into 
more of what you've focused on in some of the last 10, 15, 20 years with rhinos? So I remember I was always part of Amakala, was a founder. I wasn't rhino that committed to rhinos, although I, I'd bought the rhinos. I was there. My brother was involved. I loved seeing these animals. We had a couple, a dozen or so. But then, then I met, I'd, I hadn't met Kingsley. I knew him for a long time. And I remember I was farming goats and I was farming bananas. I was struggling to survive. I had three daughters at schools. My wife wasn't working. You know, she's been working ever since because times got so hard for me. But when she was a housewife bringing three girls up on a remote farm, you know, and then I was attacked on the farm, which is, you say, in the book for money. And then, you know, while I was traveling to Argentina, marketing on Macala, she was, uh, the house was ransacked for money and, and it was goat money and it was banana money. And, and then obviously with the, na- the national post-apartheid, there were these things called land redistribution. So I'm not sure if that's all in the book, but the farm was mm. bought out on a willing buy, willing seller basis, not like Zimbabwe. And I decided to to leave the farm. And, and the first person I phoned was Kingsley Holgate. So part of my, my job was to mentor the African people to farm the farms that we bought or sold or were in the process of selling. I then met Kingsley, a colorful character, as I said earlier. He said, well, why don't you come and join me? You know, you've, you're a marketing genius and you, you can speak the language. I'm educating kids. I want to do this. I'm, I've just come from expedition and there's this great opportunity. At the time, Project Rhino was just founded 2011 and guess why they were founded by by Kingsley's partner who was not his partner at the time because he had his wife who became late Sheila Antrobus she was inspired by none other than Dr. William Foles Mm. and the story (laughs) she founded Project Rhino why because there was a need to collaborate because of this war that had just erupted and come out of nothing Mm -hmm. it was always way north and it wasn't our problem Somebody else was dealing with it. And then it all, be, all of a sudden became that her problem. And then Sheila then founded Project Rhino. It started going very well by pulling everybody in. And Rhino Art also started by Kingsley, and he needed somebody to babysit the finances and work under an umbrella of. So I then all of a sudden joined Project Rhino, but only as a Rhino Art facilitator working with Kingsley on other marketing projects, one of them which was Sharkerland which I loved, by the way, mm. another project that completely went south because of COVID and all the other things, but it was almost a traditional. And that's because I had such a good affinity. To, do you remember I'd spoken Tosa all my life? Mm-hmm. So, well, I was an absolute fundi in Zulu. And I, because I'd been selling goats and cattle to all the Zulu people, I was now deeply entrenched in their culture, which is mm. fascinating, by the way, right from Shaka's days to living in crawls with them, to speaking their language, to understanding everything about Zulu culture. It draws you in like no, no other business. So I started marketing Sharkerland and traveling with my contacts in Amakala, selling this product, starting Rhino Art as, as a sideline. And the sideline soon got completely out of hand and it became more than a sideline. And it consumed me, you know. And as Rhino Art got more and more involved in community conservation so i started understanding and putting the context of what had been happening around mfilozi national park or provincial park mfilozi shuwi park where rhino was saved by ian play and i had the privilege of meeting him a few times mm. before he died hey there's a huge connection here i'm doing some good stuff and uh, yeah i thought maybe i'm drawing pictures of kids but you know, it resonated with me that this was a very, very an important part of conservation. Yeah. It was a 10-year vision. It wasn't an immediate vision of soldiers and boots and binoculars. Yeah. Can you mention some of the later outcomes? I, I can't remember if it's the first or the second. I think it's the first book. You kind of end with the story of the, the young kid coming up to you and, and kind of saying that, hey, I, I know someone that's poaching rhinos and just, but, but the fear... And at the same time, the trust that was built, because I, I feel like there's been similar situations, even with GCC and some of the, the youth programs we're doing with uh, one of the schools and the principals there, you know, some kids pointed out some people that were 
kind of shady and they were able to catch some people that were involved in poaching. But yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty wild to think how much impact this is having. Yeah, there's, there's always that and, and that's intelligence. And, you know, Rana Art is, is it intelligence? Is it education? But there's intelligence coming out of that. You know, we've worked out from the Rana Art through master's documents and theories of change because that's what we're actually after. What are the outcomes of what the work we're doing? What are the theories of change? You know, and there are violence, guns, the society. There's money on, on the art and all that sort of thing. You know, and and out of the theories of change, there's always that little shy boy that comes to you and says, "Hey," and it happened in Vietnam, by the way, when we were there. That my, you know, one pupil was embarrassed to tell her that her father and mother had used rhino. And we said, the best thing you can do is tell them what's happening because they thought that rhinos were not suffering. Mm -hmm. They all thought that rhino horn came from a tree like, or a reindeer, the antler that fell off its head, you know, and, and you could just grind it. It wasn't this animal that was suffering. So, yeah, th this particular case, we were in Lower Kruger working up there. And first of all, the teacher came and then the child came and then there was a bag, you know, what they like when they're embarrassed. They put their hand over their mouth and they look down and they don't want to talk to you, you know. Mm -hmm. So we try to make it awkward or less awkward for them to be able to reveal the truth on something that had happened to be able to make this arrest that we didn't, uh, in, you know, insti instigate this, this person, you know. So, you know, those are the sort of things that we, that are the success stories in the, in the whole operation, you know. Yeah. And I, I mean, just thinking about kids too, it's, you know, they're going to go back and they're going to influence their parents. And, you know, whether it's toys or something that needs to be done in the world, I feel like kids have a huge influence on their parents and getting them excited and involved is just going to change the culture probably faster than anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How did you get pulled back into the rewilding arena? Because I feel like through, throughout both of your books, you're constantly getting different projects presented back and forth to you. And and kind of getting involved. And I'm sure you say no to a lot of them, but it seems like you say yes to more than any one human could handle. I don't <laughs> know how you quite yeah. do it all, but how did you get pulled back in? And then I'd like to kind of lead into Loziba as well and, and talk about that project. Yeah, so, so rewilding, it's, it's a new word. I think it's sort of a COP26 climate change, rewilding, greenhouse gases, you know, ozone, whatever. Yeah. So it's a glorified word for range expansion. We realized that if we ever resolve poaching, and it will never be resolved anywhere in the world, I don't believe, there'll always be exploitation of animal in, in limited or excessive amounts, you know, depending on where you are based. Um, there it, it, it just must be drastic consequences to being caught to these things. We run a risk of always being able to buy animals or take them out of zoos or reproduce them through artificial insemination. And that. But the hardest part is obviously to give them a place to stay. And a habitat is vital. So habitat restoration is going to take a lot longer than actually wildlife restoration. Mm -hmm. The two go hand in hand. But, you know, we realized that range expansion was going to be a quarter of what Project Rhino did in its work, you know, and this was, this is sort of, hasn't, it's been recent, but it's kind of become like community conservation, become more and more essential to whatever we're trying to do. And things like carbon credits and payment for ecosystems and all that are starting to become more vital as, you know, people in the banks and start to realize that dirty money is not so cool anymore. So the, hence the word rewilding. And I guess, unbeknown to me, Amakala, Shamwari, Pinda Game Reserve, Velka Fonden, Matikwe Game Reserve, Pilansburg were all rewilded. Kruger Park was never really rewilded, but it was by Douglas Hamilton when he and Paul Kruger founded the place before it went, you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a sexy term. But now everybody is talking about rewilding, you know, rewilding Britain, rewilding child, rewilding Patagonia. We haven't had a rewilding America yet, but it's coming. You know, it could be regreening, you know, parts of the urban countryside or peri urban countryside in America. But it certainly is in Patagonia through uh, the foundations of 
Douglas Tompkins, and through Chile. Rewild in Europe is a big thing, and we've teamed up with Rewild in Britain. I'm going to be there in two weeks' time, you know, launching it in, in the UK, launching Rewilding Africa in the UK. Not the book. Serendipitously, the book is called Rewilding. <laughs> it is the same name as what, what our company is called, and that becomes an expensive business card again. Mm. So, you know, but it, it happened by accident, John, I think more than anything else. But we we had done the rewilding, and every time people try and complicate the Loziba story, which I know you want to ask me about, I just go back to my basic school at Amakala and think, well, how did I start that? And how did we work out what hectare belonged to who and who paid what and how the fence happened and how did you work out your game ownership and how did the staff contribute and how did this guy get repaid for what he put in? And it's actually very, very simple. But people try and complicate things with algorithms. And it's not meant to be like that. It's just meant to be a landscape which is raw and buggered and everybody contributes towards a better place. Yeah. Can you talk about how this project came about and what the initial steps were? Because, I mean, I think the easy part in some ways, bringing the wildlife to the reserve, but then like you said, the relationships, not only the landowners, but probably even more importantly, the communities that surround some of these places and working with them. And I feel like all of your your life has kind of led to a, a place where you have such a connection to a lot of the, the communities and people and culture that you're able to actually go in and have real conversations, build real relationships, which is yeah. extremely important. So yeah, yeah, if you can kind of just give an overview of what Laziba is and how it came about. Yeah. So. I hate talking about something that I haven't quite achieved. So it's not so good to say, you know, I mean, I'm a color, I can say we've achieved that, you know, and I don't say we achieved, I say we achieved it, not I, because it's a group effort. But somebody had to, to do the initial, you know, and, and I think that was maybe more William than myself. It was William that inspired people overseas. It was my dad who takes the credit for it after a bottle of whiskey in the bar, you know. <laughs> Uh, and and it'll always be like that because you know it's cool that we don't have to take the credit for it. And it was always the other people in the family of that 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 need to take the credit for doing all the work for the last ten years while I was wandering around Africa doing all these things because I needed the money and it was their livelihood. And it it is not a money game. It takes a lot of money. It's not a get rich scheme, and you have to be doing it for the greater good of people and planet because you're not going to make cash out of it. You may be able to recoup at best. You can recoup the blood, sweat and tears that you put into it. If some wealthy philanthropist comes along and I'm looking for them, but believe me, I, I do a lot of these things because I'm trying to get to somebody who says you are the man that I want to support because you know? mm-hmm. then I can multiply myself a hundred times. At the moment with Laziba, it's me and a small team of people with very little resources, buying a hectare at a hectare and an acre at a time and fighting with one or two people. And as I told you today, tragically, we had to, or yesterday, tragically, we had to put put an elephant down, which we didn't want to do. So just to get back to your question, John, and I'm sorry I'm digressing. No, uh, no. You have to have a complete knowledge of the, the project, the end goal. And what really inspired me was going to try and save these elephants that were on this park or on this farm that had broken out. And I was going to, with Chris Holcroft's help and other people's help, and some wealthy donors were going to move these elephants to another place. And we couldn't find another place and we couldn't find a road in to fix or to load the elephants. And flying around in a helicopter, just my mouth was hanging out to think that there are such places left in a built-up South Africa. And therefore, I, myself, and Bayes, the departed friend who was killed by this elephant, let's create this reserve with what do we call it. And he gave the name, and he designed the logo. It's still the same today, not me. And and, and we can get to why it is that was Mzilikatsis, the great warrior who, who was chased by Shaka's favorite wife, and that's the reason why. And he's cruel where he grew up is on the property. And in this reserve is 
there's not many people that do evict. It's wild. It has 37 different landowners, of which some of them are double landowners, so they're not all people, individual owners. And there's a lot of community. Community is defined as any local people that own the farm title in, in a beneficiary trust, when it's a European or an, an old apartheid farmer or European farmer from colonial days, it is normally a title holder or a company. But when I'm referring to land restitution, that already happened, and these were put into a community trust. So I've now got to go to these community people to convince them that tourism and conservation is the way to go. Because remember, they got the farm back from apartheid 94, and it was given to them without knowledge to do anything with that land and without the tools to create any. So what they did is they destroyed all the homes, they put the cattle back on the farm, nothing has happened since the day they owned it. And they're creating no employment from the property at all, nothing except grazing the cattle, which they want, by the way. Mm. So part of my job is to give them alternative grazing and an alternative livelihood. They're actually getting some sort of benefit either from employment in a lodge or building a fence, anti-poaching units, alien vegetation removal, upskilling of people, you know, water to their villages, and et cetera, et cetera. And you've got to be careful not to overpromise. And therefore, we had all these stories like, you know, during this process, the elephant is in, the, in their mellies or maize, and the bilderbeest are causing a death in their cattle. So some guy said, no, he's lost 95 cattle. They always exaggerate. <laughs> so, you know, and, and we had to have this. And in, in all that time, we find a lion. And what do we do with the lion? We don't want to kill the lions. But there's no other option because the fence is not there. Mm -hmm. All the people are killing snakes. We don't want them to kill pythons. You know, they're 30 years old and they're eight meters long. But they see them as food. We see them as a tourist attraction. So for five years now, I've been battling and hitting my head on this stone wall with Richard going around with his vehicle saying, Richard, tell these people that we're coming with a conservation story. No, you're not. You're coming to stake our land away. I know that white guy, mm -hmm. he, you know, we've just got out of apartheid and now he's coming to take our land back. Finally, I think we've maybe broken the camel, the straw that's broken the camel's back now. And just killing an elephant yesterday was one of them because it is destroying their crops. We've had 20 warnings. We've tried to do it five times and we just can't take it any further. Mm. Well, one person's life is going to be taken, and then the, re the, the reserve will be retarded by another five years. Yeah. So the progress has been retarded by a lot of things, John. One was COVID, two years. Mm -hmm. Another is land claim, so the dispute over land. The other one is we had rights in Natal. I don't know if you, you saw the rights last year in July, mm -hmm. a year ago. And then we had flooding not so long ago. So we had 500 people dying. They can't throw more negative stuff at us. And then we had my friend being killed. And then we had a chap being killed by a black mamba as well, you know, in the park. And they all saying black mambas are bad. And Richard is saying, the educator is saying, the snake will never kill you until you provoke it. It's part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. And that's education. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe could go into it even a little bit more, just what it's like to go into these communities. You, you do a great job at telling some of these stories in the book. But I mean, I think not only was there apartheid, but there are a lot of communities that post-apartheid were taken advantage of as well and promised things again and then let down. So it's understandable why there's a lot of resentments. But, but yeah, maybe talk a little bit more to how you approach these situations and, and try to kind of guide them to the understanding that you're trying to do something that's beneficial to them as well as the wildlife so just to go back to maybe my first book i can't remember there was a neighbor next door a white guy spur safaris he'd shot an elephant so he was in my bad books already he poached an elephant he said it was self-defense he was a bad tenant because he'd been paid out by his farm but he lived on the farm and the people that were surrounding that farm were the actual owners but he was leasing it back so he said he was in a partnership with the African people next door. And I think it's in my book. There were 65 people at the meeting. He came along. There was an argument. But 
for him, for example, he, he was meant to pay them a sum of money. He paid them year one. He paid them less year two, year, less year three, until he paid them nothing for five years. And then I come along with the alternative. And the same 60 people are under the tree with me fighting against him. And I'm trying to be the good guy in the, in the community. So that is an example of how bad some people are. And I know it's a racial thing. The white guys are the bad people creating a bad vibe in the black fraternity. And now I speak fluent language. And so I was trying to convey the story over to them. And they were having nothing of it. Interfered by this chap who was actually interfering with my story, trying to convince them to put the land in, you know. <laughs> and eventually, well, I don't know if it was karma or anything like that. Eventually, he was thrown into prison, not by them, because they were quite passive. It was for car thieving. And a year ago, he, he died in prison. Mm. So, unfortunately, those are the kind of stories. And, and only now, I've employed a lot of people, and I've got an American donor who wanted to plant a 1,000 trees. So what I did is I completely turned the positives around by t- say, saying to that same community, I'll employ you for six months. I'll put a half a million rand into those 11 people and we'll plant the thousand trees that I was meant to plant on the promenade in the city of Durban. I'll plant at Loziba because I want to give you work. Now, all of a sudden, those 11 people that are being paid every month are walking through the community saying that they've only learned so much now about climate change. They've learned that you mustn't chop down the trees that they're chopping around. And why were we planting trees? Because, you know, we, we're trying to save the erosion from going into the river. And the fact that they now are completely pro Loziba, whereas before they were in the same meeting saying, no, they don't want this white guy. He's going to. But it's taken a lot of time and public relations and talking to the kids and feeding two and a half million meals in the creches to try and convince them that they mustn't kill pythons and wildlife meat because we wildlife really cares for them. So it's, it's not something that you can just flick a light bulb and walk into something. You have to take years and years to build the trust in it. Yeah. I mean, that's another one of those, what is it, catchphrases, right, is community engagement. And I feel like a lot of NGOs are saying, yeah, we're doing community engagement. And, and there are a lot that are doing really great things. But I think... Yeah most people don't realize how much work that relationship building takes yeah. and it takes time and you can't force it. And if you're just trying to engage with communities so you can get something done quick, that's not really <laughs> going to work for you in the end. So yeah, it's, it's just so great to hear these stories and see how it's done right and, and that it does take time. And I mean, especially going as far as, you know, it's probably unrealistic for people, uh, some people, but you being able to be so immersed in the culture and understand the languages, I mean, that just creates another level of connection, right? Yeah. So a small example of what had happened next door on the next door camera. So I don't want to mention their name, or they wouldn't even mind, but they kind of did it the other way around. They took money and they commenced the work without doing the welfare side of it. Okay. And all they did was they took nine kilometers of fence down every time in protest. So when they put the fence up to put the reserve together, they took the fence down in protest. <laughs> then, they, then they sorted out their issues. And then some guy realized that th- this was starting to work because now every time they needed something resolved, they would take a kilometer of fence down. Now, there's nothing more irritating than building your fence nine times. You know, imagine your garden in Washington or whatever, and your neighbors pissed off with you, you know. Every time... You, you know, you want to settle a score with them. You you pull you pull a couple of uh, well, you don't have fences around your garden, but every time you know you you kind of pull a tree out or, or, or something that he's really trying to do. You know, mm-hmm. like a vegetable garden, and you and you planting you know a lovely set of carrots or cabbages or whatever, and you go and pull them out in protest, and then you agree on something, so he pays you to come and plant them again. Well, that's what you do. You, you pay somebody to plant them. Invariably, the same guys that, that pissed off again. And they have always one step ahead because they realize now that uh, you, they've got you to ransom. You, you have to have them as your neighbors. So you're not going to beat them. You've got to just keep them joined to, you, to your vision. 
you know, in, in every single way. And they make the best people in the bush because they've been living, you know, adjacent to the park. We're sitting in suburbia or I'm in London next week and I'm in the Rwanda, the, you know, doing the work. And I'm, I'm, I've got to see people like you and make movies. Otherwise, nobody's going to know that we're trying to do this vision. Mm. And they reliant on me because I'm the person that's got to take their story to the West. Yeah. And I want to take some of them to bring them along to these events and nurture them and show them what is out there. And they've got to be the future leaders. Yeah. And I kind of want to move to the book, Rewilding Africa, and and the challenges that you've faced over the last two, three years, especially, I mean, the book starts off with bears, death from the elephant mm-hmm. attack, COVID-19 yeah. happens, Chris Holcroft passes away. Maybe I could just actually saved a little line here from the book. I can read it and then ask you a question. But, And I think this was at, shortly after Chris had passed away and you guys were trying to relocate some elephants and he was going to fund that. Yeah. And so that night despondency hit me like a blow to the head. Although I had despaired at the numerous setbacks over the Laziba project before, I never considered giving up. This time was different. The obstacles seemed infinite. It was all too much, draining me physically, mentally, and emotionally. The costs were simply too high. My stalwart, Bears Kutsi, had given his life for the work we were doing. So indirectly had Chris Holcroft, whose passion for fundraising skills were unmatched. Sorry for butchering the names again, but that moment, it just feels like, and there's there's so many other projects too that kind of hit a wall <laughs> throughout this book. But how do you push through those moments? Because I feel like there's a lot of different people that have grand ideas or big projects or trying to do good in the world. And, you know, one of these blows would be enough mm-hmm. to, to set them off track, but to have this many kind of happen so close to each other, what was going through your head? What did you do to get yourself back on track? But just going back to what you're trying to save and seeing the beauty of it is one of them and keeping yourself distracted off the negative one and sitting on three positives I don't have my eggs in one basket and my wife is constantly irritated by it saying, why don't you do one thing properly? (laughs) One thing and do it properly. And and my philosophy is maybe I would have hung myself if I did the Loziba thing and it wasn't going well. I would have probably taken an overdose. So I've always got something in my armory that is driving me to greater heights. You know, it could be another chapter in the book. It could be next week educating some more kids or it could be funding that is about to hit but there's a million other negatives you know that's what really keeps me going if i go to lozeva and i look and i stand on a mountain and i look over this pristineness of this valley and thinking well in all the shit that's hitting the fan i am still going to win this thing it's worth saving Hmm. And, and it's you know it's happening in five other places and one is going and four are stalling. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's actually answering what you were trying to say, but yeah, by doing multiple projects at once, I'm able to savor a, a little bit of success. And Graham is tired of listening to, to my failure. <laughs> uh, and he has talked about fact, you know. This. And I always say it's 99.9%, you know, he's, He's got one or two little things where he uses his poetic glasses, you know, the the aloes stood tall like cathedrals, you know, and, mm. and the glinting in the thing. Meanwhile, the elephants had killed every bloody aloe. There wasn't one left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying to bring some beauty to the the <laughs> yeah. tragedies. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. What about the, the people you surround yourself? I mean, we mentioned a couple of close friends that passed away, but... It seems like you've surrounded yourself and maybe it's just a part of doing this kind of work. These types of people show up in your life, but how have you been able to feel supported by those people? Yeah, I'm very supported by my African people. One is in Diteni Kometa, the old storyteller that you may have read about. Another one is Nunu Jobe, barefoot man who, who walks in the bush with rhinos and he's a rhino whisperer. Richard Mabanga, who has been with me in Vietnam, who talks to the kids every single day, you know, he's a showman of note. Aben Zuzo is another one. I've got closer guys. I mean, there's a chap called Saseko Mahenja. I've just been filming with him. He's a chopper pilot. Grew up barefoot 
on, on Amakala. Um, mother was the manager who's now married this beautiful wildlife vet from the UK called Lisa Graham. They've got a child. You know, th- these are people that are incredible inspirations. You know, another girl I taught, Rhino Art, in 2013, is now a head ranger or driving a vehicle. She's a female. We live between the two of us. We had no money. I stayed in a backpacker's place for 80 rand in St. Lucia that she could maybe come with me. I didn't want to stay in a smart hotel and she was in the backpack. So we slumped it up together, not in the same room. Of course, but, you know, and these are stories of inspiration. And Nat Geo wanted to do a story on her. And I said, Dobek on course is your girl. You know, she's come through the ranks and she's a remarkable story. Rags to riches, you know. So those are the people. But then, of course, you have my other partners like Colleen Ruet, who, who's uh, an ecologist and a fellow director, and Chris Small, who's now my, my latest director friend, who, you know, out of, the, uh, out of adversity have been absolutely remarkable, you know, and like my brother and like my other, I'm a kind of partners. Um, these are uh, amazing people. And then, of course, you know, in the gorillas, John Kehekwa, the most amazing ape man that I think I would ever meet and if fully deserving of the Earthshot Prize last year in the UK. And he lost only to be put by a country called Costa Rica by the president, which I think was highly unfair. <laughs> but again, you know, very humbling like he is. You know, said, well, again, Africa sucks the hunted, proverbial hunted. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we're getting close to the end here, but John Kahekwa's story, he shows up in both books and just seems like one of the most amazing humans. Maybe one day we'll be able to get him on the podcast, but maybe tell yeah. a little bit more of his story just to give people a taste. Yeah, he's he's an incredible man. In fact, another woman who read, read, wrote my book from New Zealand, she is writing John's book under my instruction, only because I think if there was ever a sequel to Gorillas in the Mist, which he starred in, by the way, mm. John Kehekwe, he'll be the main character. I don't ever think that any of my two books and maybe a third will ever be a movie quality. Certainly John Kehekwe, having saved or, or been part of saving the Eastern Lowland Gorillas in Kawizi Birga with his story starting the Pole Pole Foundation, which means slowly, slowly in Swahili, mm. just from a $10 tip, and, you know, he's taken Al Gore to the gorillas, he's taken Bill Gates to the gorillas, you know, and some incredible people, very humble man, and, and his family works for nothing, just absolute inspiration, you know. He's planted four million trees, you know. He's won the Tusk Award, and unlike me, who's won no awards, but <laughs> John is just one of the, these incredible guys who luckily has won awards, but awards don't buy you everything. They give you a title, but they don't give you sustainability. Yeah. Uh, what was the small amount that he won from the Tusk Award? He actually reinvested into his programs, right? He bought trees again. Yeah. With that Tusk Award, he took poachers' wives to see gorillas in the forest. And through that, he was able to save more lives. You know? um, the one thing that, that he's been very mum about is the death of the latest gorilla, uh, the most filmed gorilla in the world, possibly, or lowland gorilla, Magaruka. Magaruka or Chimanuka? Do you remember? I think it was Ch- Chimanuka, right? Or Chima- Chimanuka, yeah. Chimanuka. Ma- Magaruka has just died, unfortunately. Was one he was the one with the out of hand, right? Out of hand, yeah. yeah. Hey, your comprehension is pretty good, John. Well done. <laughs> I've got notes. <laughs> you passed the test. But, but look, John Kehekwe is somebody who, who needs the accolades, the most amazing person. He stayed here with me. He's done the rhino art. He and I have started gorilla art. Sadly, we can't do enough. He's got nobody coming through to see the gorillas. The place is just like a, it's like a morgue at the moment, the DRC. And yet I've taken 50 people there, including my wife and daughter, and everybody that goes to the DRC with him in the hellhole that is Bukavu, have all absolutely loved it. So it's not what you think it is, you know, and, and the work he's doing deserves, honestly, higher, higher honours, you know, or deserves some funding because he's working with people that have not really been paid well at all, or some of them haven't even been paid, you know. 
and through very good philanthropy and, and some seriously good people like Peter Eastwood, who's donated over COVID, you know, through going with me to the to the gorillas and helped us with rhinos and rhino art and whatever we've been able to survive through these terrible, deep, difficult periods. Yeah, it just seems like a really amazing human being with almost no resources. Yeah. Doing some great work. I mean, everyone knows about the gorillas and even if you haven't thought about going to see them or have much connection to conservation, I feel like it's, you know, once people hear about gorillas, it's it's just one of those things that people connect with on a very deep level. So the fact that he's doing all this and, and let, very few people are supporting it is is just kind of absurd, really. So the more help we can give him, the better. Yeah, his signal is not good, but he's certainly somebody that I would it would recommend to get on the podcast, you yeah. know, and maybe he does it when he's in, in, in a decent place visiting me or something like that. Yeah. You know? yeah, that would be really amazing. Tell his story more. Maybe one last story connected back to rewilding the Tuskers, the, the Tembe Elephant Park Tuskers. Can you talk about that project a little bit? I actually, uh, when I was in South Africa in 2020, towards the end there, it was really the only time I wasn't working or like shooting something. We just went and enjoyed an experience and we went to Tembe Elephant Park and I didn't get to see a Tusker from a vehicle, but the one night we were eating and I think they have like a, a camera out by a water hole and, yeah. and we got to see one of them approach there. So it was, it was a pretty cool experience. And they have so many amazing birds. We did a lot of birding while we were there too, the yeah. pink throated twin spots, but yeah, talk a little not. bit about that project, why it's important, what a Tusker is, I guess, for people that don't know and why this project's so important. Yeah, so, you know, obviously the Tuskers are, are, are really getting less and less through ivory poaching right throughout Africa. And so Tembe has got probably about 10 Tuskers left. The elephant bodies aren't that massive, but they've got something in their gene pool that nobody else has got, well, certainly in Southern Africa. But Ambacelli have got the same. I think the cover on my book is a thing called Big Tim, and there have been others, you know, that have died. Satao is one of them. Um, in the past, you know, they are mentioned in the book. But I'm really enamored with the Tembe place, so much so that I'm I'm doing a corridor now. I'm part of doing a corridor between Tembe and Penda and Mkuzi. Again, talking to the same community with the same, com- not the same. I must admit we will advance, but we, you know, the population pressure is enormous. It's a sand forest for these beautiful pod mahogany trees which you would have seen when you were there, you know, um, in, in Tembe. It'll be going across the road. And the, the big advantage of that is in Mozambique, Anaka are, are starting to put money into the transfrontier. So there's enormous transfrontier advantage of the Tembe Elephant Park. Obviously, some of the Tuskers will, their genes will continue to to go well and, and to dilute into other populations. But Hopefully, they'll have more habitat. And at the moment, there are 230 odd elephants in, in this very small area, which is 30,000 hectares. And there's no room for expansion. So there's only one plan for the Tembi Tuskers, and that's to go south and a little bit north. You know. But what we're trying to do is obviously get Amakala to, to take some of these Tuskers, not for my lifetime, but probably for our grandkids or, or whatever, You know, just mm-hmm. to try and see if we can spread these genes out into other places and obviously to have the viewing potential of seeing these great animals, you know, grace our landscapes, which is so vital. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, what a Tusker is, what their, their Tusker are usually five feet or more and over a hundred pounds, which is, I mean, that's just really impressive if you haven't seen, I mean, everyone's probably seen a picture and hasn't realized that it's one of these very few elephants left in the world. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a very exciting project and yeah, looking forward to seeing how it develops. I mean, it's one of those things especially with the you know, trying to move some young bulls that you guys think might have the right genes but it takes yeah. years before you really know <laughs> if you got them or not. So, it's kind of a long-term project in that respect. Well, next time I'll, I'll take you to see some tests definitely. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Let's uh, wrap up with a question of, you know, what advice would you give someone that's getting into this space, conservation, trying to do some good in the world? I mean, you've you've had uh, a lot of experience doing so many different things, a lot of setbacks, a lot of successes. What would you tell someone that's just starting out that has a passion for this type of work? 
Yeah, John, um, I think it's written in one of the books. Somebody sent me a line the other day. It said, for every day that you, you're still standing, you're winning. <laughs> and because you get knocked down, you've got to stand up. And you get knocked down, you know, maybe Muhammad Ali, like in the ring type of thing. And you've got to get up and, and keep, keep going, you know, against all adversity. So, I mean, that, that's the moral side of it, you know, whether you physically can take that or whether you've got the relationship to be able to withstand the financial constraints and the emotional constraints of failing time and time again. But I, I think, you know, conservation doesn't really need, it, it needs some genius because there are people in banks and world, the World Bank was giving us a proposal two, year, two days ago, which is looking phenomenal. But we need hard grinding people that are resilient in, in the bush, you know, and that are good with tracking and that are they could be dyslexic or they could be just people's people, you know, or they could be animal lovers. And and I want to just say that and I and I said previously, why has everybody got a pet? <laughs> because they're compassionate. Animals are compassionate towards humans. Yes, a few people get killed by animals in conflict, but invariably because we invade in their space, and that's what Bayes did. And his widow, Una, wasn't very upset with him because he provoked the animal. So animals will pacify, and, and they are healing properties for sick people, for our sick society. In a bit. So to give people advice, I, I, I don't know, um, because... I mean, if I was David Attenborough, I could probably tell people, you know, what to do. Or if I was a, a very successful conservationist like Ian Blair. But I guess he died in the same way, thinking, shit, I need to do more, you know. Um, it's only after you've gone or after you've achieved, you'd look back and think, well, you know, I, maybe I have done something. Or maybe I have educated 700,000 kids with Kingsley and a team. Or I have fed two and a half million meals and porridge, you know, and I've taken children to Vietnam and that. But have I actually saved rhinos? No. I'm failing. Mm. If I can put 50 rhinos into Lozeba before I die and do another 10 projects and write shit about them, you know, in books, I'll, I'll leave a legacy. Yeah. And if there's anybody out there wanting to help me do it, hey, come along for the ride. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I think that's. I can assure you, you're going to have some some good times around the fire. Yeah, I mean those those are some of the benefits, right? That I hear from a lot of people is the pay might not be great, but the experiences you have, the landscapes, the the wildlife, the people you're around. I mean, it's hard to beat that <laughs> in the end. Hey, I mean, look at the movie trailer. You know, you guys and the movie's going to be wonderful. I know just by looking at the trailer, the quality is there. You know. Those are the stories that need to go out because they they're gonna they're gonna make a difference too. I'm writing about it. You you got it on a on the screen. Yeah, appreciate that. And yeah, I mean it's it's definitely a group effort. Like all of these projects, you know, it's not one person. And yeah, we're excited to share that trailer eventually with everyone and get this film out into the world. But yeah, I think kind of going back to what you're saying about you know if you're still standing, if you're winning. I mean, I think that's that's a great lesson because with all of these projects, even with the film, it's like there's days where you think you've got it and you're like, oh, we finally got this done. And then the next day, disaster strikes and you got to be able to stand back up and keep going because it's going to happen over and over again, <laughs> right? Mm. I guess if, if there's no problems, then you're dead. <laughs> yeah, and look, money, money would solve a lot of my problems, uh, John. But as in my neighbor's sense, you know, he, he said, well, we just had too much money. We couldn't make it because we had too much money. So we have got to hit the balance. Well, Grant, this has been this has been amazing talking with you. And how can people follow along, find the books, uh, get involved with what you're doing? What's the best way to go about it? I'm on Amazon for books. <laughs> I'll be in America in, in November on a roadshow, which I, I want to see as many people as I can. Mostly people like you and Matt that have helped me along, you know, and people that I've created this relationship with through taking them around to projects. You know, people like Chris Holcroft's Legacy, True Wild, Nevar Hikmet, who, who I'll be seeing, they've donated money for land through through their nonprofits. Those are all, and just champions, you know, Lisa Goldsmith is one from 
Los Angeles. I've got another one in Vancouver Island who's been remarkable. She's got a travel company traversing Africa. So there have been little people, big people, but little people, little little pushes all along the way, individual people. And then obviously they're the big donors. You know, but I'm on Instagram, not well, and I'm, I'm not a Facebook fan, but I've got a couple of thousand on LinkedIn. And Project Rhino is, is our main campaign line, you know. Rewilding Africa is also the one, but I would like Project Rhino to survive. And if it can survive, then it can, then it can do rewilding. But without Project Rhino, I can do nothing. And people need to travel to Amakala because that's my ancestral home. And it'll always be to support William and vets and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to get down to Amakala next time in South Africa, for sure. I haven't been to that part of the country yet. Yeah. And yeah, you have a website as well, grantfolds.com, which I think all of those links are on. So if, if you want to find all of these different things, you can just go there and definitely get the books. There's so many stories we didn't even touch base on. So a lot to digest and just kind of a master class, I feel, in conservation too, with just all of the different experiences and projects and I mean, it's great to see the failures because it, you learn a ton from those as well, as well as the successes. So yeah, I really appreciate you coming on here and spending so much time. It's, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, John, a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Rhino Man podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you're excited to see the film succeed, please subscribe and review our podcast on Spotify and iTunes. Then follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Rhino Man the Movie. More details about Rhino Man, the social impact campaign, and future screenings are at rhinomanthemovie.org. To learn more about the Global Conservation Corps and their work, visit globalconservationcorps.org. Sign up for the newsletter and follow GCC on all of the social platforms. If you like this podcast, make sure to subscribe and catch up on GCC's Voices of Nature podcast, where Bob Ludke interviews a wide range of people who have dedicated their lives to making a difference in conservation. A special thanks goes out to Simone Wilson for the music for this podcast. He's the brilliant composer for Rhino Man the Movie. Learn more about his work at simonewilsonmusic.com. Until next time, I'm John Jerko, and this is the Rhino Man Podcast. <laughs>